Social entrepreneur Jeremy Leggett is the author of The Energy of Nations, The Carbon War, and Half Gone. He founded the company Solar Century and African solar lighting charity Solar Aid. Described by The Observer as Britain's most respected green energy boss, he writes and blogs for The Guardian and The Financial Times. He was awarded Entrepreneur of the Year at the New Energy Awards and lectures on business and environment at the Universities of Oxford, Cambridge and St. Gallen. Well, thank you. My brief this morning is to give an account of the state of play in the global energy transition as a sort of backdrop for our discussions in the next two days. So let me zip through that. Um, it's also told in one of those books that you saw, The Winning of the Carb War, the updated edition of that is actually published today, it includes 2016 and 2017. And in this book, I argue that we can tell this story as a great saga with multiple dramatic storylines and three big themes, meta-narratives, as the literary people call them. And those three are global society awakening, as we've heard from Christiana, to a threat to civilization, uh, not, in not in totality, but in critical mass, enough of a mass to get forward momentum. And in parallel, we have an insurgency, that's us and our confederates and the other members of the clean energy family, um, fundamentally disrupting an incumbency and doing that much faster than most people appreciate out there. And then third, the incumbency itself facing a multiplicity of threats, increasingly existential threats, and very often unconnected to the other two meta-narratives. So let me make the case for each of the three in turn, and clearly I think any one of them would be powerful, but the three in synergy, that's what makes this so exciting and really gives us uh, the sense that we can get to a decarbonized world as the Paris Agreement requires. So this begins with governments, but you know, it's about civil society as a whole. There's what Christiana and her colleagues call a groundswell right across civil society. And I think we see the resilience of this most clearly in November 2016 in Marrakesh, shortly after President Trump was elected where the leaders and ministers from these 195 nations that had adopted Paris said, you know what, we have an urgent duty here, this is irreversible, you heard Christiana use that word a lot, but for governments to use it, that's a big thing. And despite all entreaties, he decides he's going to leave the Paris Agreement. Actually, just in passing, he, he can't do that until a putative second term, legally, under the treaty, but anyway, he's going to try to do that, and um, uh, he says in his speech, I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris, and there are many days when I watch all this drama as I open my laptop in the morning that it sort of strikes me that, that real life is stranger than fiction because, of course, the very next day, Pittsburgh turns around and says, you know what, you don't speak for us, and we're going 100% renewable by 2035. Um, and the day after that, Michael Bloomberg lined up a load of other American cities, states, and businesses who say, we're going to meet these targets. And within a few days of that, they number more than 1,000. And they represent more than a third of U US GDP. And this We Are Still In movement is growing all the time. So you get this remarkable drama where 19 governments can turn up with the most powerful nation on the earth and say, you are in a minority of one. Even Syria and Nicaragua have now adopted the Paris Agreement. You are a rogue nation, and we will treat you as such in the communique. And again, they use the word irreversible, the big word. But it's not just about um, cities, uh, not uh, governments, it's about city governments. And uh, in June, uh, mayors of 7,000 plus cities said they were going to help uh, the U.S. achieved their commitments and the equivalent of them around the world and in America, 250 mayors met to say we're going to go 100% renewable by 2035 and this includes a good few Republican cities. And it's not just about climate change. We're learning depressing things about air pollution lately. 
Um, the Lancet Commission in October publishing the most comprehensive review. The chop rate is 9 million people a year, mostly from air pollution. Um, and that's, uh, they think, almost certainly a really significant under, underestimate, they say. And yet, they can quantify the welfare losses at 4.6 trillion a year. That's 6% of GDP. So when Christiana talks about this being an economic issue, it really is. And that's without the economic impacts of climate change. So governments are doing meaningful things about this. China's air apocalypse in December 2016 followed in January by them shutting down 120 gigawatts of coal. There's 103 power plants, including dozens under construction with investments already in place. This is what we mean when we talk about stranded assets. Real stranding, fast. Um, and in September, a vice minister for industry saying, uh, it's not just about coal, it's about cars, and we're gonna ban production of petrol and diesel cars in the near future, is what he said. So we're all waiting with bated breath to find out what this means, because that really is a game changer. Same in India, appalling air pollution. In November 2016, so bad, the PM 2.5s, so bad, they're not even registering on the instruments that we use around the world. And again, a focus on electric vehicles, the power minister saying, um, you know, we, we're gonna go 100% by 2030, and thinking of innovative ways in which to uh, finance this from savings on gasoline. France uh, going to ban petrol and diesel cars by 2040, but that's not very radical these days. The cities are going much faster. Paris, Mexico, Madrid, Athens, um, bans by 2025 in the face of their air pollution. Now, um, the corporate world really plays a vital role in all this. I would argue, a bit, probably a bit controversial, but I would argue it has been the single biggest role across civil society in, in achieving the change that Christiana's talked about and these trends that I'm talking about here. I think we see it most um, emblemized in the RE100 campaign, uh, which has now reached the point where the electricity demand created by these companies is greater than that consumed by Poland at the moment. So if these 122 uh, companies were actually a country rolled into one, they would be the 24th biggest in the world in terms of electricity use. This is just remarkable progress. And companies are campaigning, they're behaving increasingly, many of them like environment groups. So more than 600 companies and financial institutions have signed up the letter to President Trump appealing to him to not get out of Paris, or stay in it. Um, and in parallel with all this, of course, the regulators are playing in the game. They didn't for many years in climate. Uh, I was told at the Bank of England that this was not an issue with financial consequences as recently as 2013, 2014, sorry. I described that meeting in the book. But um, things change, and the task force uh, Christiana talked about was set up in December 2015 at Paris. It reported a year later. It's important to, to be clear that these are companies. This isn't a task force of academics or environmentalists. They're companies with market cap of one and a half trillion, and financial institutions with assets of 20 trillion. And they're recommending um, climate change disclosure routinely, of course, so that investors can make informed choices, pay tied to anti-climate action in the top, in the C-suite, and a host of other things that are now being enacted. And as of President Macron's um, climate summit, uh, 237 companies with market cap of 6.3 trillion now actually supporting and enacting this sort of thing, and again, campaigning. So some of them, funds managing 26 trillion, have pledged to pressure the worst 100 companies on emissions. Now, that's huge because those worst 100 companies represent two thirds or more of global greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see how quickly this could change as this begins to bear fruit, and it's already bearing fruit. Even the great giant ExxonMobil, the company that environmentalists love to hate, 
has bent in front of this wind. In December, they announced that this shareholder pressure will uh, force them to disclose the impact of the Paris targets two degrees on their business. And that's happening right now and being digested by the analyst community. And the ultimate sanction, of course, of institutions is not just to pressure companies, but to say, you know what, we've had enough with you, we're going to divest completely. And increasingly, companies are doing this. Uh, the funds that have divested or promised to divest now, or as of December 2016, sorry, were um, measured at five trillion. And crucially, 80% of those were commercial and pension funds, not you know universities and church groups and the people you, you might think would be doing this for ethical reasons. The people are doing it for business reasons. New York City, uh, most recently in January this year, and of course, the, all the religious groups are very active, but particularly the Catholic Church, led by Pope Francis, their biggest faith-based divestment in October last year, and BNP Paribas. Now, let me just make an aside comment here. You can imagine how painful it is for an Englishman to talk about French leadership. But <laughs> this is a persistent theme. You've probably n noticed it by now. The, the French have played an absolute blinder from Paris onwards, and they continue to do so right across French society. It's wonderful to watch. BNP Paribas dropping all business with a wide range of oil and gas companies, you know, anyone involved in the tar sands, LNG terminals, pipelines, Arctic, that kind of thing. Uh, just, you know, we're not going to do it. Sorry, not the end of the story. And if CEOs want writing on the wall 10 feet high, this is it. Den Norges Bank, manager of the biggest sovereign wealth fund in the world, um, saying to its boss, the Norwegian government, you know, guys, we would actually quite like it if you would tell us to divest from oil and gas. This is a fund built entirely from oil and gas proceeds. Um, and we want you to do it because the risk is now getting unacceptable. French again, AXA. Um, new dimension here, not only are we divesting from certain fossil fuels, but we're going to stop insuring your infrastructure the pipelines. Now, that begins to take off. These companies are in real trouble. And this, at the Macron summit in Paris in December, um, got the biggest round of applause from all the diplomats and the business leaders there. It was the president of the World Bank saying, we're no longer investing in oil and gas in the developing world. This institution that has invested so much for so long, no longer doing it from next year. Then all backed up by the legal system. And this is a drama really worth watching because um, after these horrific hurricanes last summer in the States and the Atlantic, a group of world-class scientists for the first time um, said the attribution science is now so good, we think, that we're prepared to stand up in law courts, stick our hands on our hearts, swear on the Bible, that we can ascribe a percentage to anthropogenic enhancement of the greenhouse effect. This is huge because it's going to unlock the floodgates for legal action. And within days, San Francisco and Oakland sued five oil companies for damages from rising sea level. Uh, they are helped in this by a lawyer who was instrumental in um, the cases against big tobacco for their um, inconvenient liability issues. And then in January this year, New York joins those cities and others suing the oil companies for climate change damage to the city, but also deliberate deception, essentially securities fraud, misrepresenting the science of climate change for a long time. And again, I emphasize there are just 100 companies that in this case, carbon disclosure project estimate, 71% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see how this could tip quite easily into a complete rout. So now we get to us, meta-narrative two, the insurgency. Let's start with solar. Um, everyone here knows all this, so I'm going to zip through a couple of things just to make you all feel good. This is the Bloomberg summary, recent auctions as of January 2017, showing us already less than half the average price of coal and going even lower. And the auction prices keep coming in. It's really interesting that they actually re-awarded this after the initial allocation, um, and it's gone to a higher price, to $23 a megawatt hour. And um, I'm sure everyone here is aware 
the first coal-fired power plant operating coal-fired power plant has been shut down to be replaced um, by solar because it's cheaper to build new solar than it is to operate old coal in certain settings, and that's going to expand. Started with the um, inappropriately named Pleasant Prairie coal plant. You all know this, you've seen our exponential curves. Just to check that everyone here realizes that we were outstandingly the biggest sector in terms of new additions in 2016, with our compadres in wind equal second with coal. And this diagram, if you haven't had time to look at it yet, is one of the most beautiful diagrams I've seen in a long time from IRENA. It shows the project costs and the auction uh, sort of prices, the project prices, the auction prices for a whole range of projects and auctions for the four different technologies between 2010 and 2020. And the yellow band is the band of fossil fuel prices, and you can see how competitive we already are and how much more competitive we're going to be going forward. So we have things like um, all of China's new power in 2015, met with wind and solar, uh, almost 90% of new power in Europe coming from renewables in 2016, India increasingly ambitious in its programs, the September 2017 um, scheme where uh, President Modi uh, hopes to get uh, solar storage and LEDs into every willing home by the end of this year, the year we're in, and increasingly reflected in um, the demographics of the workforces, many more people working in solar and wind than coal, and all this is so popular. If you haven't seen the Edelman study for Orsted, uh, 26,000 people in 13 countries, 82% of them believing it's important to create a world fully powered, not just mostly powered, fully powered by renewables in answer to that question. And increasingly, we in the industry are very bullish about being able to do this, especially with storage in the frame. And my favorite study of all this comes from the University of La Penranta group, uh, where you see their estimates going forward. And this is the first model to use hourly resolution at the, both the global and the local scale with real data. They had a year of real weather data going into the, into the modeling, and you see what happens to solar going forward. So attractive as we think our space is now, just imagine what's going to happen if that scenario becomes reality. And of course, it's cheaper to go this route. So levelized cost of energy in constant euros, Average is 70 now, um, and in 2050, in current euros, will be 52 in this simulation. But still, we have to reverse a certain equation. Uh, for electricity, renewable investment, at this time, according to the IEA, 287 billion, and, and despite everything I've just said, 650 billion still going into oil and gas. That has to be uh, quite quickly turned around. Battery costs down, everyone here knows uh, the details of this. And every time that poor old Bloomberg New Energy Finance publish um, a forecast, they have to say, well, we got the last one wrong on the downside, now we're rev revising up again. So now the most recent one is conventional cars cheaper, uh, sorry, EVs cheaper than conventional cars in most countries by 2020, 2025. And this is the one sector that pro rata is on track with its share of, of a two degree target if the manufacturers produce the numbers they say they're going to now. Of course, it's not just about cars, it's about utility scale power, as we all know, Tesla's big battery in South Australia, and this is a wonderful drama to follow. Um, if, you have, if you're not aware of this one, do uh, Google this occasionally to see what's going on. Basically, this battery is undercutting the scam of the, of the Australian gas cartel, who you know, routinely um, hike prices when there's a frequency control issue. They're not so much able to do that now as the battery chips in. So Tesla is an important pioneer on all this, but it's a long time since Tesla has just been the only game in town. All the auto manufacturers are now on board this ship, um, as we saw at the Paris Motor Show in October 2016. And for those of you, I'm sure there are many of you in this room who aspire to be CEOs of giant companies, please note in passing the dress code that will be required of you. 
So in July 2017, we saw the first um, automaker, the wonderful Volvo, uh, actually come out with um, calling time on internal combustion engine cars from 2019. We've seen China's first auto company say, we're only going to make EVs from 2025. And overlaying all this, we have digitalization essentially yet to come. This is the cutting edge for most of us. Our trade body, Solar Power Europe, tells us that it will be adding $800 billion of additional value to renewables by 2030. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a lot more than that. And this is the pro proprietary cutting edge that many people in this room hold great secrets in their heads over. But just, just some snapshots, wonderful stuff going on. National Grid, a really conservative incumbency company in Britain, at least it used to be, but now working with Google, investigating the application of their deep mind artificial intelligence to supply and demand on the UK grid. And of course, all being noticed by people in increasingly interesting places. So the crown prince of Abu Dhabi saying to his people in January 2016, we're going to be out of oil in 50 years, and you're not going to be unhappy about it because of what we will invested, have invested the proceeds in in the interim, all this 21st century the, um, technology that will be so different from the 20th century. Same in Saudi Arabia with talk of a $2 trillion mega fund for what the Deputy Crown Prince calls the post-oil era, Saudi Arabia. Um, and, you know, a closing point on this meta-narrative, the Silicon Valley futurists, people like Ray Kurzweil, Google's futurist, um, say that we're all very bad, even if we're professional analysts, with exponential effects. We find it very difficult to get our heads around exponential effects. And he makes the point, solar's doubled every two years between um, 2000 and, 20, and 2016, so eight doublings, but it's still only a tiny fraction of global energy supply. You double that six more times, which is 12 years if it's on the same periodicity, and you have more than 100% of global energy, not electricity, energy. So I don't think he thinks that's going to happen, um, and neither would it be a good idea just with solar when we have all the other members of the family. But it, it makes the point, I think, really well. So the final meta-narrative about the incumbency, let's start with coal, poor old coal. Um, production has fallen steeply since 2011. Um, in October last year, we had the first global survey of coal phase-out plants among the companies that have been in coal or are in coal um, over the last, uh, since 2010, and more than a quarter of them uh, have exited in that period. Nearly 70% have no active plans now in coal. Um, important elements of the supply chain, just uh, playing the games up, the railroad bosses, um, fossil fuels are dead, and the CEO of CF CSX saying, you know, I'm not going to finance any more locomotives. And who would have thought just a few years ago that the IEA would be saying, um, no new coal plants in China, please, because they make no economic sense. In India, too, the Central Electricity Authority, so long a supporter, saying um, in December, you know what, we've redone our sums and we uh, don't need new, any, any new capacity additions until 2022, and will they even then? And in Australia, the biggest coal export port shifting away from coal because they can see the writing on the wall. Economics again, Carbon Tracker pointing out that more than half of the EU's coal-fired power plants are loss-making, they're almost all be by 2030, and the utilities responding. Um, all major EU utilities saying they're going to commit to carbon neutral power well before 2050. The supply chain also under pressure in the financial pages. Siemens and GE um, chastised for being, quotes, too far from the sun, i.e. too far from us, too wedded to gas turbines, and as for nuclear, the Economist, long a supporter of it, says now, just look at the economics, it's pointless. Their favorite um, headline, Hinkley, pointless. We should spend the billions on making renewables work. So finally then, just a few thoughts about the oil and gas industry. Um, their problem is also economic. 
a lot of people don't realize that in 2016, even at average $50 oil, they made no money. They couldn't cover their costs, the industry as a whole. And it was the least profitable US in industry last year. Outrageously, a lot of these companies are simply buying time, as Bloomberg puts it, by financing their debt interest with more debt. And the shale uh, phenomenon, which we hear so much about, the shale boom, I mean, this couldn't possibly have been built on a great Ponzi scheme of debt, could it? Yes, it has been. There is no oil price since 2012 at which the industry has made any money. And these are 33 shale-weighted exploration companies from the four main shale areas. You see all the cash flows are negative. Huge failure stories. Um, a mistake to have inv invested 20 billion in the shale, says the poor old chair of BHP. And there's a serious financial issue here. Bloomberg calls this the debt wall. This is the amount of bonds on US energy companies below investment grade. And look at what's coming in, uh, sorry, 2020. That wall uh, heading at us at above $200 billion to be serviced by an industry that in 2016 used 75% of its operating cash flow just to service that relatively small requirement. Now, this would be the worst time to find that your plays were actually getting exhausted, wouldn't it? And that's happening too. These are the main shale plays and the productivity of the, way, uh, of the wells from plotted in the Financial Times recently. So there's another problem facing them, and then they've got all the environmental stuff. So having for a long time said, said we don't really create any problems with the environment, there is a whole catalog of studies now coming out that uh, say exactly the contrary. So you've got whole countries now banning fracking. So the shale phenomenon, unprofitable as it is, is likely to be a feature of the United States. Scotland banned it, Germany banned it in June 2016 over concerns of contamination of the water supply needed by their beer industry. One of the best excuses for banning fracking. And French leadership again, not only banning fracking, but all oil exploration in all of its territories and hoping the ban will be, quotes, contagious. So um, even when they drill, uh, they invest in drilling, the discoveries are plunging. Um, they've dried up to their lowest level in 60 years. And then you've got the demand story um, of electric vehicles and how just a small increase in electric vehicles can be deeply disruptive of oil because two million barrels a day displaced. That's when oil crises happen historically that we're due for that on current trends by 2023 as Bloomberg plotted. Then there's the um, delivery record of this industry, dismal as the Financial Times calls it, Ernst & Young study of 365 big mega projects most of them behind time and over budget. And this may be their single biggest problem, worker demographics. This is an industry facing a huge worker shortage by their own admission. The average age of the oil industry worker is 49. That includes all the graduates around the world. Huge problem, especially when many of them, difficult to keep a slight edge of schadenfreude out of your voice at this time, when so many of them are going to the solar sector. So even their friends talk about the long twilight of this industry. Goldman Sachs pointing out, crikey, you know, well, they never made much money anyway. Now we come to think about it. This is cash return on capital invested. And you can see even when the oil price is high, that's going down. Oil has a crisis of faith. So the price has gone up recently. You see that in yellow here. But the indices, the stock indices, showing that they're not responding. You know, investors are losing faith, and who can be surprised by that, especially when the best performing stock as of July 2017 was Suncor, and it was rewarded by investors because it said it stopped looking for oil, and it's going to give the capex back to the investors as dividends. So to finish, we know that big oil and gas companies are taking out hedge bets, and it's unsurprising. We have Statoil with its uh, Statcraft, sorry, 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 no, no, I'm getting confused. Statoil um, with its wonderful floating wind projects off Scotland, more of that to come, taking the first stake in utility scale power. Shell supplying electricity to 
uh, commercial users in the UK and buying a platform, First Utility, to help them do that. Also a car charging company, you see them taking positions and a solar developer, BP2, with their investment in light source. But the bosses, uh, Van Burden and Dudley, being very clear, don't overstate this, this is not a race to renewables, as Bob Dudley put it in February. Well, actually, Bob, it should be. It is and it should be, because if you don't race, others are going to eat your lunch. And then, very finally, Let's be encouraged by one great success story that shows this can be done. It's not an oil and gas major, but it was an oil and gas company. Dong, in June, um, launching its IPO, one of the most successful, of the most successful of that year, but at that stage was 75% renewables by November, uh, divesting its gas grid and all oil and gas going, and in October, 2017, changing its name from Danish oil and natural gas to Orsted, I'm not sure I pronounced that right, um, named after a, an electricity pioneer of Danish origin to reflect, quotes, its profound strategic transformation from black to green energy. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what the global energy transition is all about. Dong proves that it can be done. Uh, more strength to all your arms in continuing to ensure that that's done through appropriate financing. The drama will continue, of course, and you can follow it on my website there. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, unfortunately, um, we've really, really, really run out of time, uh, Jeremy, so we're going to have to ask people to please engage with you during the networking session. Yes, uh, this that. coffee break is sponsored by Scatex Solar, and we'll be back here in the room at 11 a.m. for the regional outlook trend. So thanks again, Jeremy. Good to have you. Thank you.